Eclipse, a story from Singapore. Illness changes everything. It changes your daily routine. It changes how you live, how you think, how you look at the world. But there is one thing it doesn't change love. Will and Alice are making a long and painful journey, but they are making it together and there are still some beautiful things in their life. You used to bake anything and everything, rich cakes full of fruit and brandy, lovely light cakes that disappeared at the soft touch of a tongue, fresh bread, dusty white or else brown and shiny. You got up early every day and left the bedroom while he, the birds sang from the branches outside our window. Meanwhile, I yawned and move it into the small warm place you left behind in the bed. A little later when I walk there would be a hot fog of smells, sweet heavy smells that filled our little flat. I would walk into the kitchen and find you standing there, hot coffee and you hand as you watch it your cakes cooling down on the table. That last time you were baking because I had asked it for something special, something you hadn't tried before. A round cake, one my mother made for me when I was 10 to make me feel better because I was ill and had to stay at home all day. You and I were in bed, comfortable, reading out books. I had pulled it at your side of the blanket and ask it, could you, would you make that cake for me? How did she make it? You wanted to know. What did it taste like? Eggy and not very sweet. You look it interesting. Eggy? Yes, I said. And it was a very pale yellow in color. And it was soft and light. Eggy, soft and light. All right, you smile it and move it your back close to mine. The next morning when I walked sleepily into the kitchen I had forgotten about asking you for the cake. It was there still warm on the table. You cut a delicious perfect slice and put it in my mouth. That was almost a year ago. I remember how now how sick you had become that day after. At first I thought it was because of the cake, felt sure it was nothing more than a stomach cold, silly of me, remembering I cannot stop myself lagging out loud, the sound comes out strange, one of our neighbors, a little old lady who always seems surprised to see me, I am too tall, so foreign looking for this place stops to smile. I return the smile, wondering at the difficulty of making the muscles round my mouth walk. I open the door of your favorite baker's shop. The first time you took me there, you told me you had known the place since you were a child. I imagine that you five years old, reaching up to pick out a soft sugar cake. Every week we use it to stop there on the way to the market and look at the cakes in the window. One of them would catch your ear and you would spend the rest of the afternoon reading your richly colored cookbooks, your fingers dancing over the words. There is you always said a cake for every occasion. Now in our kitchen, instead of the eggs and butter, and fruit instead of the shining bowls and well-used bread boards instead of all that there are a large tin spilled high on the table containing in enriched milk and the powered food which you hate to so much in a blender the blender is a white plastic plain looking machine ugly but necessary i use it every morning and afternoon to make the thick, tasteless kind of soup which is to the only food you can eat. 
A bell rings as I enter the baker's. The only customer, an old Chinese man, is walking slowly up and down past all the cakes on show in the glass container. He stops, stares at me for a second, then walks back and starts looking carefully at the cakes again. The lady owner, who has gray hair, looks up. Her hands, which she places in front of her, are small and colored with a fine dusting of white. I see that she recognizes me. How nice, she had said when I asked it for the words happy lunar eclipse to be written across the cake I was ordering. Hi, I'm here for my cake, I say. Hello, yes, we have it ready. She goes in to the back of the shop to fetch it. The old man is still trying to decide which of the cakes he wants. He bends over the glass container, then straightens up and smiles at me. I am choosing something for my granddaughter, he says in clear and hesitating English. Her mother's bringing her over to visit. I say nothing, only smile back in return. You have children, he asks. I learned it a long time ago that the local people think nothing of asking personal questions. They ask them so warmly and with so much real interest that I answer right back. I surprised myself the first time that happened. No, I say, thinking about the names, you said you like it. Lara for a girl. Mark, if it's a boy. Oh, but you're married, he asks, his gray head a little on one side. Yes, just not yet. I give another smile as best as can. He is about, so say, to say more when the lady returns with my cake in a box. It is a relief to stop talking to him, and I am so pleased that I smile warmly at her. She puts the box down in front of me. Here it is, she says, pushing it towards me in the lifting the lid. Okay, she adds, smiling. Yes, I say, thank you, goodbye. Candles are inside the box, she adds, bye-bye. I take the box from her carefully and turn to go. Behind me, I hear the old man asks, Ask the lady for some help. He can't quite decide. I check my watch as I walk home, just past six, over an hour to go. The birds are calling out from the thick trees. Three. I look up and watch a few clouds make their way quickly across the blue sky. As I stand there, red and brown, I fallen leaves caught by the wind collect around my shoes. It takes me less than 10 minutes to walk back, and soon I am unlocking the front door. I call out like I do every time I come home, and just like every single time you call back. Your voice is quiet, it's hard to hear through the walls. Alice, I am home, I shout. When I am around you, I am cheerful, bright. Around you, I have to be. I drink a glass of water in the kitchen, get myself together before I go in and see you. I know you have been ill now for months, but when I am always for just a moment and hour, I forget. The first time you went to hospital for chemo chemotherapy, I watched the young nurse shaking and unsure push the needle in your arm one, two, three times before she finally got it right. You had your eyes closed, but your face was expressionless. You stayed like that all the way through. The machine kept going slowly, archingly, so you started to shiver and said you were cold. I pulled blankets on top of you and still they weren't enough. You shook for two hours. At the end of it, 
you were exhausted, you fell asleep in the riddle in the right home in the car. I carried you in and put you to bed. I made sure you were asleep before I went to the second bathroom and bent over the toilet. I thought I was going to be sick. Then I sat on the cold floor until I heard you call out for me. Your voice sounded like a dream. That same evening your friends came over. Jan whom you had grown up with proudly offered you a rich dark cake and sank. Happy first hammer, Alice. I watched you stop smiling for a moment, but then your eyes shone and you laughed and clapped along with the rest of them. I just stood and watched it hot with anger. You took a few bites cautions little bites before the sickness came after an hour everyone put their arms around you said goodbye and left i went with them to the door and down to the street as soon as we were a little way from the apartment i took jan by his collar and started shaking him i think i shouted happy first hammer are you mad Someone held me back then, but it took a few moments for me to realize what I was doing. When I slept back, I saw that Jan's face was red and his mouth was thin. He put a hand on my shoulder and said, Will, it's all right, it's all right, while looking everywhere else except at me. Back inside, you were already asleep. I calmed myself down. I watched you as you breathed your face shining in the moon's soft light. I make myself busy now, putting everything away. The cake in the fridge, my wallet and case on the dining table. The table is covered with well-worn books and papers about your disease information that I have read and reread many times. Then I walk the fifteen steps. That is how many it takes for me to go to you from the moment I come through the front door. You are very pale and painfully seen lying in bed half buried under the blanket. I entered the room feeling my face go red. You look like a stranger. Has someone taken you? place in the little time I have been away. You use it to have rich dark hair, but lying in our bed there is a girl with no hair at all on her head. She is watching me as I enter the room. Every time I go away and come back again, I feel I am entering someone else flat. This is not our home, not my place, not our things. The cont less silly little things that two people can collect in five years, five years worth of books, clothes and stones from the beach, and photos taken with a blind hand while our faces full of light are close to each other's. Where is Ellie? I think, while I stand in the doorway. But the minute I get near and you reach up to Run your hand over my hair, reach up and pull me in with your small hands and look straight into me with your dark eyes. I see you again, you are right there, hidden under that pale face, you are in there. Hey baby, you say, how is it outside? Okay, there is a bit of wind through, where we are going to have to watch the eclipse to, through the window, okay? We don't want you to catch a cold. I bend down and kiss you. Wherever you say, I retu you return it to your book. I do my usual routine of tidying your blankets and making you comfortable before you gently push my hands away. Take a rest, you say. You have had a long day. I sign and give in. I take one of the many books, peel it up by the bed and let myself lie down next to you. I open the book but simply 
stare at it at one line on a page, letting it run in front of my eyes over and over again. Soon I hear you breathing deeply and look around to see you sleeping, with one finger making the page where you stop at reading. I watch through the window as the sky lights up into bright orange and purple flames, while darkness slowly falls. Quietly I get out of bed and go into the kitchen for the cake and everything else that we need. When I come back you are already sitting up in bed. Is it time you ask? Soon I say looking at my watch. Just 10 minutes to go. I put the cake box, cake, cake box in front of you. I lift up the lid and we both look inside. There had been just enough room for the words. Eclipse had been written in the shape of a smile just at the edge of the cake. You laugh and tell me to put the candles in and light them. So I do. We wait a little while more. We look out of the window and watch as a dark shadow starts to cover the full moon and the Silvery white becomes a yellowish brown until, in the end, all that is left in the half light is a deep red ball giving out a dull pinkish light in the night sky. Look, you whisper, then blow out the candles. I nod and reach from the knife, cutting a stride line down the middle of the cake and then another, then I pass it over a delicious perfect slice onto your plate. Oh, red velvet cake, you say, we have never had this before. The One Armed Theft A story from Nigeria Judges have a difficult job, they sit in a love court and listen to stories, stories from the prosecutor, from the lawyers, from the accused, but whose story is the true and whose is a lie. Abdul is confident that he understands the judge, but the judge is also confident that she understands adult. For five years adult had been a beggar at the dusty Maraba crossroads. He had learned how to walk on people's feelings like an actor. He always knew the right face to wear. There was one face which made people feel so sorry for him that his begging bowl rang with the sound of their coins. But there were some passers-by who kept their money tightly in their pockets and refused to give to beggars. For these people he had another face, one which made them feel so bad that they could not sleep at nights. Today in Abuja's main courtroom, as Abdul stood sudden, surrounded by police and lawyers, it was easy for him to decide which face to wear. This judge will never sleep well if she finds me guilty, he told to himself. You worship this man is a thief, said the prosecutor, pointing at, at Abdul. A shopkeeper caught him running away with a sack of rice. The judge's star was almost frightened. Her sharp eyes shone with intelligence, and although she was only 40-something, she seems to have several lifetimes of experience. Adult met her look with dull, miserable eyes, then lowered his head and stared at his feet. It was an expression that had never failed him. The sad, thoughtful eyes of a dog with a shyness of the trembling young bride. Your worship, said Adolf's lawyer, this is a kind of stupid mistake the Nigerian police are famous for. 
How can a one armed man steal a 40 kilogram sack of rice? Even I cannot lift that sack onto my back with my two arms. I understand that the accused had a regular begging place outside the shop. He informs me, and I truly believe him, that the shopkeeper threatened to do anything possible to move him away from the front of the shop. He has been fearlessly accused. The judge's eyes showed that a battle between feeling and reason was taking place inside her head. Abdul lifted the stump of his right arm and scratched his face with it. His arm had been cut off at the elbow and the stump was clearly visible. It looked so ugly that most people felt very sorry for him as soon as they saw it. This is not the first time this man has stolen, the prosecutor said. Abdul's lawyer jumped up. You worship the prosecutor is being unfair. It's true that the accused was once a thief. In the fact, a court in another part of the country ordered his right arm to be cut off as a punishment, but that was years ago, and since then he has stolen nothing. We know that he has been involved in seven recent robbers, the prosecutor continued. Your worship, believe me, hardened thieves like him don't change easily. The cool wind blowing into the courtroom failed to dry Adol's hot, wet forehead. He shook his head slowly. He stared down at the sack of rice, which was on the floor between the rows of lawyers and the sign escaped his lips. It was a long-suffering sign of a man who accepted that he is going to be punished for something he did not do. The judge's eyes were fierce as she spoke to the prosecutor. You had, you bad man, you are supposed to prosecute people who have done wrong, not attack those who are innocent. Have you no heart left in you? Her expression softened as she returned to Adal. The court apologizes to you. You can go home and take the sack of rice with you. I hope it will help you to forget all this unpleasantness. Go on, carry the sack of rice and go home right now. Adol could not believe his ears. He turned around and in two steps he had reached the sack of rice. He put his left arm around it dropped on one knee, touched his head to the ground, and with a sudden fast movement of his back and arm, lifted the sack onto his shoulders. He stood up again with difficulty, bent over by the heavy sack. Thank you very much, your worship, he said, trying to catch his breath. Thank you, too, the judge said. Police, arrest him.
Thank you.